And we are very happy to be joined by the director of Leaving Neverland, still available to view on 10 Play, uh, Dan Reed. Hello, Dan. Hi there, Ed. Now, do you, I can only imagine, given the passion of MJ fans around the world right now, you must be copping a lot of hate right now. Well, uh, when the film was announced at Sundance, there was an immediate reaction, I'd say, almost within minutes. And we had torrents of nasty emails and, you know, I didn't even go on Twitter. But um, it's all died down now. You know, the film's gone out in the States and in the UK and, of course, in Australia. And um, I know this sounds a bit corny, but the messages of hate have been replaced by messages of love and gratitude from people who have really connected with the film or people who've had experiences that they can, you know, sort of make them relate to Wade and James. So it's been, uh, it's been a real turnaround. It's it's pretty gutsy thing to do. You must have. Was there any hesitation when you just when you heard these stories when you decided to put the film out? Did you think shit? What am I getting myself into? Um, no, because I thought this was such a without sounding um, <laughs> too sort of uh, smug. I, I thought it was a really important, really really important story to tell. I thought um, it could be of comfort to a lot of people who also been victims of child sexual abuse. And it was like getting a big truth out there. So that was, I've always been more excited about that than kind of fearful about the risks. While sometimes it sounds like people are still undecided or it's a 50-50 split whether some people think he's guilty or not, the details that you show in your film are so graphic and, and detailed. Is there any reason to doubt them at, at all in your eyes? No, there isn't any reason to doubt them. I mean, I, I did a huge amount of... Um, uh, Digging along with you know a, quite a big research team into uh, all the available documents for the the, the um, police investigations by the Los Angeles Police Department and the Santa Barbara Sheriff uh, back you know going back to '93 and we never found anything that cast any doubt on Wade or James's account. Of course, we were looking really hard for that because we didn't want to broadcast anything that was going to make us look really stupid. <laughs> You're right, Dan. I think people are starting to forget that too. Like I, we, we, some of the comments that I've seen around on online about how that they, how people don't believe it, it it's, it's almost as if they're trying to pretend that you just grabbed Wade and James and stuck them down and said, hey guys, we're just going to have a quick chat and I'm going to film it and I'm going to put it out tomorrow. That seems to be yeah. <laughs> part of their defense, which is, oh, hang on, hang on a second. They're, they're just talking. I mean, it's, it's, it's ludicrous, to be honest. And we actually had uh, Brandy Jackson, who is the niece of Michael Jackson, who I'm sure you're aware of. She was on yes. our program yesterday. And I want to play you just a little bit of what she said in defense of her uncle, if you wouldn't mind, because I think it goes to the heart of sure, what, go ahead, go ahead. What, what, the, what the defenders have been saying. This is what she said. You were together with Wade Robson. Is that correct? You're in a relationship with him. That's correct, yeah. Um, it, it's seven plus years. Uh, so he's got these stories that, um, you know, give you this really sinister image of, of what was taking place, but it really didn't happen that way. And that's why he doesn't mention me in this documentary, because it would kill everything he's trying to, to insinuate. Dan, what do you have to say? Well, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense. I mean, she says... <laughs> She's saying they were together for seven years. Now, he met his wife, Amanda. I'm talking about Wade now. Wade met yeah. Amanda when he was 19, or I think maybe even younger, mm. 18 or 19. So that would have meant that Brandy was in a sexual relationship with Wade from the age of 12. Really? Yeah. Um, yep. You know, I've spoken to Joy Robson about this, and she said they were sort of childhood sweethearts, or as far as she knew anyway. And you know, she'd drop Wade off at Brandy's house. And, you know, but they weren't living together, I think, at the age of 12, 13, or were they? I mean, <laughs> that doesn't really make much sense. No, of course, um, of course it doesn't. And, and, and so, you know, um, also the intense period of um, Wade's, you know, it's terrible to say it, but sexual relationship with Michael Jackson was from the age of seven to the age of nine. That was, if you like, again, to use a dreadful word, the honeymoon period, the period when they were really seeing each other a lot. And he makes it clear in the film, he didn't really see Jackson that much after that. They had occasional meetings in which, you know, they, they would follow the old pattern and, and end up having sex. But it's conceivable that he could have had other, Jackson mm. certainly had other relationships and Wade could have had as well. It doesn't, the fact that he was mm. seeing, you know, like boyfriend and girlfriend with, with Brandy at the age of 12 or 13 doesn't mean that 
he wasn't seeing Jackson too. So yeah. I don't really follow the logic, to be honest. Yeah, no, I nor, agree. N- no, nor did I. But it was. But it's you know you want to give people a chance, as you know, in documentary to, oh, give, yeah. their, to give their I'm side. To, like you know, bring it on. I'm keen to debunk any any kind of myth that's going on out there because there's so many of them. Did you ever you approach know, any of the the Jacksons to to come on and show their side of the story in this documentary? Well, I mean, what's their side of the story? Um, Michael was a great guy and he would never yeah. do anything like that. I mean, that's not really, it doesn't, you know, when you're talking about a really serious crime that happened behind closed doors with no witnesses, mm. um, and, and what's the point of bringing on a family member who's got a huge interest in defending the brand? Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, the brand of work is right. Was a, was a great guy, you know? That is true. Do you think that there must have had to have been shortly for, for this level of, of abuse, there had to be other people complicit in, in it for to allow it to happen? Do you think other people knew not, it wasn't just Michael? I'm positive that other people knew. Uh, Michael was surrounded by people who enabled his life, everything from, you know, picking up his underwear and, and little kiddies' underwear as well, according to the chambermaid's testimony. Mm. Um, you know, security guards who were roving around all the time and, uh, you know, obviously saw stuff. And that's all on the record. Um, uh, and and pe- you know, senior people around Jackson in his business, my, I'm sure must have known what do you think he was doing behind closed doors with all those little boys. I mean, now you know, that one little boy. Sorry, continue. Said he, he spent he spent something like uh, nearly 400 nights with Jackson, and what what and he now claims he wasn't abused, which you know that's Brett Barnes, who's an Australian, and I have to accept what he says. You know, mm. I, I'm not in the business of outing anyone, but one has mm. to wonder what people thought Jackson was doing with these little boys in bed. Okay. Actually, on that on that point, Dan, because I think it's a good one to make now, because some of the famous, uh, I don't know, friends, I want to know what you would call them, of Michael Jackson, when they were young, your, Fel- your Corey Feldmans, your Macaulay Culkins, and your Aaron Carters, they're coming out sort of, well, not Corey Feldman, but, you know, they are some, some of them are still coming out in support of Jackson. I, I want to play you another little bit of audio, if I could. This is from Aaron Carter. This is him yesterday. Right. This is him talking right. about when he was 15 with Michael Jackson. I was 15. I hung out with Michael Jackson. I stayed at his house. I stayed in his bedroom. How am I supposed to understand that when my own personal experience with him was gentle and beautiful and loving and embracing? I mean... Uh, Even the word embracing, I mean... It's yeah, just... what do you make of that? You've got to bear in mind that my, the, the age that the age that all of... Uh, that Michael, you know, routinely lost interest in the little boys that he saw, the age that he lost interest was around 14, 15. Yeah. So oh, no, Aaron no, no, no. wasn't of an age that... Michael would have been interested in him anyway, but also, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've, uh, I understand why Aaron's coming out because he, he there was a fake Twitter account, that um, a, a fake Wade Robson Twitter account that's now been taken down that that kind of tweeted Jeez. at him and said, oh, you know, you you've got a story to tell too, Aaron. Of course, he's pissed <laughs> oh off. God, what, as, as a documentary filmmaker, how do you feel about fake Twitter accounts <laughs> going and atting people, Dan? Well, yeah, I think I, so. Uh, you know, I think it's not it's not your ordinary fan. That was quite a subtle attempt at at, uh, at like you know messing with people, and you, well, yeah. you, you have to wonder. It feels like a proper black ops kind of technique. You have to wonder who's behind it. Mm. Yeah. Have people uh, since it's aired? Have people contacted you, you directly with more stories of kind of untoward things happening? Um, we've had email. Yeah, I just had an email actually from one of Michael's drivers. Um, uh, from that period, so I haven't contacted him back yet. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we haven't. I think, uh, you know, for more victims to come out, if that's what you're asking, I think it will take a long, longer time. You know, this is a huge step if someone of is going to break their silence. It's There's certainly step. people in his circle. Yeah, ha- exactly. That thought things might be happening. I do want to play you one more bit, if I could, Dan, because we spoke to a uh, Queensland policeman, of course, Wade is originally from Queensland, who's been working right. in the space of chasing pedophiles, both, you know, in the real world and on and in on and, and online. I know they're both in the real world. Yeah. I'm only using it as a distinction to say how his job has evolved. Um, and we, we spoke to him a couple of days ago about the work that he does and continues to do. And at the end, I asked him if he'd seen uh, your film. And uh, well, this is a little bit about what he told us. Yeah, I remember in 2008, I met an FBI uh, profiler, an analyst, who was involved to some degree in uh, the investigations into Jackson, and mm. uh, it was a categoric yes, he did wow. it. And that's that's from someone in thir- for, you know who's talking inside the law enforcement agencies, uh, Dan, 30 years experience. Yeah, I interviewed uh, a lot of the guys, um, the investigators from 93 and 2003, 
to you know the two year long police investigations, and I didn't meet a single investigator who had any doubt whatsoever of Jackson's guilt. And I remember interviewing a legendary LAPD guy who's a specialist in child sexual abuse, and he said, you know, Jack Jackson is a is a copybook paedophile. The way he grooms, the way you know all, all of his techniques, separating the kid from the parents and creating this sense of being unique and special. And, you know, everything he did was co was absolutely copybook. This is a guy who's got the experience of four thousand child sexual abuse investigations. I mean. You know, it, the guilt was was there for all to see, and it's astonishing that he was acquitted on his uh, mm. in his criminal trial. So we can no longer really classify him as just a misunderstood boy who never grew up, uh, just a flat out abuser. That was the, that was his cover story, wasn't it? And it was very persuasive. A lot of people got taken in. He never had a childhood. That's why he had to spend every night in bed with a little boy. That mm. doesn't make any sense, really, does it? No. Was he no. ever going to get a fair trial in LA, in America, given that he is who he is? Do you think he was ever going to get a fair trial? Well, I mean, he got... He got oh, the victims the, the get a fair trial, I should say. Way. He, got a, he got a more than a fair trial, didn't he? I, mean, he, 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 I don't think the little boy who yeah. went up against him in court got a fair no, trial. No way. There was an astonishing bit, Dan, where you speak, you know, they, the jurors speak in the States afterwards. And that one juror who said that she didn't like the way that, what is it, the defense prosecution winked at her? She said, don't wink at me, lady. I mean, no, it was, it was, it was, it was Ga so Gavin Arvizo was the little boy who changed it. Oh, sorry, Gavin, him. yes. Gavin's right. mum, yeah. Gavin's mum was a bit of a disaster in the witness box. And she basically pissed off the jury and she's the one who was like wagging her finger. Yeah, um, that's right. Don't wag and, your finger, and, sorry. Uh, Don't wag your finger. Yeah. Man. So it became all about it came all about the kid's mum who had a sort of checkered past. And yeah. although there was plenty of good evidence that the child had been molested, it, it that the whole trial skewed towards Jackson being the victim. And this is the extraordinary thing that the estate and the Jackson organization has done is to portray Michael Jackson as the victim mm. when when in fact he's the he's a you know monstrous predator. What, what do we do now? Like we're a radio station, you know, we, our fans and our listeners have, have loved his music, you know, their whole life and all around the world, we're all trying to decide what we should do now. Should we continue to play his music or not in your eyes? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't really have a view on this. I think it's a personal thing. I don't think we should ban music or burn books or do anything like that in our culture. I don't think that's a, that's a good look for us. I think if people, you know, radio stations, plays music and loads of people phone in to complain, then they'll have to take a view. Mm. You know, will people want to play his music at, at Kitty's birthday parties if your child is, you know, seven the age Wade Robson was when he was molested? Um, I, I don't know whether that's a nice feeling for people, but, you know, his music is part of people, it's a sort of soundtrack to people's lives, yeah. isn't it? It's so much part of our culture. I don't mm. think you can rip that out. So people are going to have to listen to it, but also accept the fact that he was, you know, a, a terribly sick man. Mm. Leaving Neverland is the documentary. You can see it on 10 play uh, made uh, by Dan Reed uh, with HBO. It is a quite incredible uh, piece. So, Dan, hey, thank you for making it. It uh, was I Thanks, couldn't, yeah, it was entertaining and horrific all at the same time, but very important story. Uh, one more before I let you go, Dan. Do you, do you reckon Jackson's record company knew about it? I mean, there were some... It's on tour that this stuff's happening. They're, they're moving parents further away from him with bedrooms to, to keep him with the boys. It just, as the net got wider, I thought, does the record company know something here and they just don't want to know about it? I, I don't know. I think it's very difficult all these years after um, yeah, okay. to establish who knew what and what and when they knew it. I yeah. think, you know, Wayne and James are suing the estate as well they should. Yeah. As well because they, should. they say all these people who were in positions of responsibility look the other way while mm. James and I, you know, both these two boys were being molested and every, yeah. it, was, it was perfectly obvious what was going on. So that's why, and you know, they want their day in court. They want to be able to prove to a jury or to a judge that, that they, you know, that, that these people should be held accountable and that, that child abuse did take place. Yeah. Um, that's you know, that's another thing. The, the, the Jacksonites always say, oh, they're all oh, they're after money, after money. You don't get money automatically when you go to court. You have to win your case. If mm. you've won your case, it means you've proved your case in court. So, mm. you know, let mm. them have their day in court, get off their backs, and give them the benefit of the doubt. Thank you, Dan Reid. All right, mate. Thank you.